Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's City Law School 125th anniversary event. At City Law School, we teach some 2,500 students every year at all stages of legal education, from the Bachelor of Laws to the Graduate Diploma of Law, which originated here, to the Master of Laws, to the PhD, to Barrister and Solicitor Vocational Courses. We're distinctive because of being a fully comprehensive law school situated in the heart of London. We get students from incredibly diverse social and educational backgrounds from London, the United Kingdom, Europe, and other countries. We have a very long history of educating lawyers, judges, politicians, and business people, which dates back to the 19th century in the form of the Inns of Court Law School, which together with the Centre for Legal Studies formed the City Law School. Alumni include names of historic significance, such as Mahatma Gandhi and Muhammad Jinnal, pivotal figures in the stories of India and Pakistan. Other alumni include two British Prime Ministers, Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, many of the City of London's most prominent barristers, solicitors and judges, and leaders of a wide variety of business and community organisations. Tonight I'll be talking with Cherie Blair about her life and career, our guest is someone who's achieved an incredible amount in the law and in public life. She's a leading barrister in Queen's Council, has been a part-time judge, is known for her advocacy of human rights and her international work for women's rights. Her foundation has supported over 140,000 women in developing economies. She's been honoured for her services to women's issues and charities. Would you please join with me in welcoming Cherie Blair. Lawyers are often perceived as coming from privileged backgrounds, but your childhood wasn't easy. Your father wasn't there, and you grew up shaped by two strong women. What influence did your childhood have on you? Oh, I think it has, like everybody else, a really uh, profound influence on me. I, I often say that I was lucky in many ways to be born where I was, when I was, um, at a time when opportunities for women was starting to open up in our country, when uh, the education system was becoming available um, to boys and girls from my background. So both my mother and my grandmother, and I was brought up by my mother and her mother-in-law, um, they both had to leave school at 14. Um, and they were determined that my sister and I should have the education that they had never have had. And often people say, oh, it's, a, it's amazing that you have come so far. And I often think, how far could my grandmother and my mother have come had they had the opportunities that I was so lucky to be able to have? But obviously, I would never have been able to take them up if it hadn't been for their determination that they wanted me to have those opportunities. And my grandmother was a great reader. She was uh, quite a passionate advocate within her own local community. Everybody knew her. She was one of those characters. If there was anyone had a problem, they would go to go to see her. Uh, my mum, who was a miner's daughter, um, had become an actress and then had found herself later on abandoned by her husband and having to find a job. When of course she had had no qualifications because she'd left school at 14 when her own mother had died, and she had a 10-year-old brother and her father, who was a shop firer in the mines, you know, he said, you have to come and look after us. So she had, um, but you know, she managed to find a job. She worked first of all at a fish and chip shop. And then she managed to get a job in one of the big department stores called Lewis's, which was part of the Sears group. And uh, through that, uh, she ended up managing their travel bureau business and, um, you know, made a career for herself. But I was very conscious growing up, both how much she had to sacrifice to make sure that my sister and I even could, you know, even could afford the uniform to the grammar school that we went to. Uh, and also that, um, that as, a, as a woman, you need to be able to support yourself because you never know what might happen. In her case, her husband abandoned her. In my father's case, actually, he was, at the, he was at the grammar school and he did his first 
certificate, and then he was going to go on and study for hire. And his own father, who was a merchant seaman, fell down the ship's hold and broke his pelvis. And so my father at 16 also had to give up his education and go, go, go to work. He then eventually went on to become a, an actor. So, you know, I, it was, I was very conscious of the fact that life can do strange things to you and you need to be able to have the, the ability to, to look after yourself and, of course, your family. There, there wasn't anyone in your family who was a lawyer. So what, what was it that made you think about going into the law? Well, it, it, was, a str it was a strange thing, really, because um, for various reasons, uh, you know, I love history and, you know, I, I, I got very good results. But I was very conscious that I was the first person at the age of 18 in my family who wasn't earning a living. And, you know, um, if I was going to go to university, I felt very much that I ought to do something that would guarantee me a job. And obviously, the nuns in my convent school thought that we should all, as girls, we could do as much as we can. But in the end, our ultimate aim was to become a, either a nun, which didn't appeal, or <laughs> used to pray, you know, please, God, please don't send me a vocation. And the other was um, obviously a good Catholic mother, which I suppose in some ways I did become. <laughs> but um, so I didn't want to become a teacher. Uh, um, and at the time, I had a boyfriend, and his mother said to me, well, Cherie, you know, you're always debating, which I was, and acting, um, and you've always got an argument about something. <laughs> have, you, have you ever thought of being a lawyer? And uh, I thought, well, that sounds practical. Uh, and my, my grandmother was a great admirer of Rose Halbron, QC. And Rose Halbron was, some of you will know, the first woman QC, uh, because we've just been celebrating this last year, 100 years, <laughs> of women in the law, because it wasn't until 1919 that women were allowed to join the professions. And in 1949, uh, Rose Halbron became one of the two first women QCs. But Rose was a Liverpool girl. she come from Liverpool. She was uh, a Jewish girl from Liverpool who had qualified as a barrister, and partly out of the luck, if you like, that the war took a lot of the, the males out of the, the profession. Um, she became very famous. She was the first woman to become the recorder of Liverpool. She was the first woman to defend uh, somebody uh, who was on charge, trial for murder, the death penalty. Um, I mean, she did so many firsts, including becoming the first woman QC. And my grandma was a great admirer of Rose Halbron, and she used to go in those days when there wasn't so much television, you know, to watch Rose Halbron conduct a criminal trial. Was, 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 a, was, a, was a treat. And so Grandma had always admired her. And then in the early 70s, uh, Margaret Lockwood, who was a British actress who'd been a sort of Hollywood star, starred in a series on TV called Justice. And she was a female QC. So I thought, gosh, this is incredibly gla glamorous. So if <laughs> If, if, if Rose from Liverpool can do it, surely Cherie from Liverpool can do it too. <laughs> Didn't realise, of course, that, you know, slightly more difficult than I, perhaps I might have thought. <laughs> At the age of 16, you joined the Labour Party. Nowadays, joining a political party that young or at all would be more unusual. What, what prompted you to do so? Well, I'm not sure, actually. I think you certainly can join, the, the and people do, in fact... Uh, um, and in Scotland, of course, now you can vote in, in certainly in their um, Scottish Parliament elections at 16. What drove me to it? Well, that's a combination of my grandmother uh, and my well, and my mother and father. Uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, was a, not only a, a shop firer, he was also a, a shop steward <laughs> and a local councillor and a Labour Party activist and a, a had a rank in the Salvation Army as well, so he was Salvationist and completely teetotal. And my father, of course, um, was a very much, particularly in the 60s, when he was uh, a famous son of Liverpool because he starred in a, a, one of the first comedy soaps, which was called Till Death Do Us Part, where he played himself. He played the radical scouse son-in-law 
of the East End uh, character played by Warren Mitchell, who was basically a bigot, and uh, um, the two of them clashed. But he was very well known as a Labour Party uh, member. He he made his first visit to Downing Street during Harold Wilson's time. Um, we didn't see a lot of him, though we saw something of him. But you know, the first he, he sent me Jermaine Greer's A Female Eunuch and uh, a book called The Doomsday Book, which was about um, the environmental issues even in the 70s that people were talking about. So just this was all part of the way I was brought up, really. So joining the Labour Party, it just seemed the obvious uh, thing to do. You were the first in your family then to go to university. How did you find it and what subjects sort of, you know, took your, you know, were you passionate about? Well, of course, I was incredibly naive. I was um, just reminding someone the other day that, so I got this, uh, got able to go to the LSE. I got a full grant, so this is, this is marvellous. And I turned up at the LSE for the Threshers Week, knocked on the door, and they said to me, um, for the first week we were living in this hall of residence, they say, where, where are you living next? And I said, aren't you going to put them? You, know, you mean I have to, I have to find accommodation? <laughs> and I don't know how it has managed to pass us by. My mother had, had no idea. So I actually came down to London uh, without anywhere to, <laughs> anywhere to go. Uh, so they had the brilliant idea of sending me to Notting Hill to a uh, hall of Residence, which was mainly for teacher training, girls in teacher training, run by nuns. So <laughs> after two days in this, I thought, I have been at a convent school. I am not spending my university career with a, a curfew at, at 10 o'clock run by nuns. So I went back to the Passfield Hall, which is still an LSE Hall of Residence here. I knocked on the door, and as an act of advocacy, I persuaded them to fit me in somewhere. And so, um, you know, so I really didn't know what to expect. I'd never really spoken to or met anyone who'd been to a public school in my life, uh, obviously, a university, when in those days, what, six or seven percent of students came from working class homes. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of students who came from public school, lots of grammar school students, as I was uh, myself. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what to expect with the law, but I absolutely loved it, and I was very lucky LSE uh, teaches law as a social science, and as part of our public law training, um, they, they also had contacts with the Labour Party at that point, 1972. Labour was in opposition. Uh, some of the government people would, uh, would come and give lectures in our public law lecture. I did Labour law in my third year, and that was at a time when we, that was the, no one really knew. It had just started as a discipline, and uh, I was very lucky to be taught by some of the greats in, 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 in that area, and I decided that was the kind of law I wanted to do. Now, when I was at the LSE, I did labor law, I did history of English law, I did tribal law, I did human rights and civil liberties. My husband at the same time was reading law in um, Oxford, and he did not like it very much, and he read Roman law and all the other traditional subjects. So, you know, I was introduced to, to very much the idea of how law is an instrument of social change and how it's also intimately connected with the, the rule of law, with the government, um, with how we conduct ourselves as a society. So with all those ideas buzzing in my mind, uh, I thought, what would I do next? And you were top in the country in your bar exams, and at the same time, uh, your future husband was studying to be a barrister with us, and I don't think did quite as well. Um, no. <laughs> no, he scraped through on a third. Let's, let's, be, let's be truthful. <laughs> so a third, a third can, you can be successful on a third. Um, how, how did you get to, well, we, get to meet? We met through Lincoln's Inn. So the first time we met, uh, because originally I thought I'd go to I'd go do an uh, um, BCL at Oxford. That was the idea because they said, you know, obviously a career in in academic law would be would be great. Um, but when I got there and I was offered a place, and I, I looked around Oxford and all I could see seemed to be all these posh people drinking champagne, and I thought, <laughs> I don't feel comfortable about this. 
And they'd said to me at Oxford, they said, well, it's always good to have a professional qualification if you want to be an academic lawyer. And, you know, the bar finals, they're easy, so you could do that at the same time. Uh, so I got the application forms, wrote off to, the, to join the bar, and Lincoln's Inn offered me a scholarship. And I thought, actually, why am I going to write about other people doing the law? Why don't I do it myself? So that's how I came to be at Lincoln's Inn. Um, uh, and that's when I discovered that actually uh, you, I was very lucky that Lincoln's Inn gave me an entrance scholarship because I wouldn't have been able to pay what was £75 fee then. I didn't have £75. My mother, earning £8 a week, certainly didn't have £75 a week. So Lincoln's Inn gave me the scholarship. And then I needed to support myself. And I applied for a Lincoln's Inn scholarship. And my name's Blair. No, 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 it's Booth, isn't it? My name was... My name's Booth, his was Blair, and we ended up sitting next to each other to go in for the interview. And as I always say, I did get the scholarship, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we first met, and we sort of vaguely knew each other, and then we ended up doing pupillage together. And so you were both pupils of Derry Irvine, who mm. later became the Lord Chancellor. What, what did you learn from him? Oh. Uh, well, so many things. Derry was the most fantastic teacher. I mean, he was cruel in many ways to his pupils. We used to have to write out our draft opinions for him with double spacing between each line and double margins, and he would literally go through it word by word. You know, this is when, and Lauren is here from Omni with me, or no, I go mad about split infinities, because Derry would absolutely beat you up if you split the infinities. Um, and, uh, you know, but he was also an incredible teacher uh, and very generous uh, uh, to both Tony and me. But the other thing that happened, of course, is for the first time in my life, I suddenly learned that being clever and knowing the right answers and working hard was not enough. And it wasn't enough because it was a big problem. And as Derry said to me at the end of my pupilage, look, Cherie, there's, I can get my pupil here as a permanent place with one. I've had, I can only get one of my pupils in. And, you know, he's the boy and you're the girl. So obviously, we've got to go for the boy. Because in those days, like only 10% of the profession were women. Um, so many women um, would opt out after they had their children. You know, it was quite difficult. So a lot of the women who were succeeding, not Rose, she has daughter, but others would drop out. And also I think they thought I was too political. I was, you know, a girl from Liverpool, so I was perfectly open about being a Labour Party person and what I believed. Uh, Tony was better trained by his background as a public school boy in Oxbridge, and so was a little bit more diplomatic about that. So I think they genuinely thought I was going to be the politician. How wrong they were, of course. Because <laughs> here I am, still the lawyer, after 40 years. And, you know, Tony, as you know, buggered off and did something else. <laughs> Thinking of what it was like for women at that time, I mean, the number of women at Lincoln's Inn was very low. There wouldn't have been many other women advocates. What was your experience then when you did get tenancy in another, another chamber, sort of as a young woman in the profession? Well, to be fair, of course, Derry, in those days you could do that. Derry was very good for me, and he went off because he knew I was particularly interested in uh, employment law. And so he went to his mate, Frederick Reynolds, who was doing employment law as a junior. There's only a few people doing it, and said to him, I've got this great girl, you should take her. And literally, I went, I was interviewed uh, by a few of them, and they said, okay, we'll give you a tenancy. Believe me, that's not how it happens these days. Uh, it's not that easy in, in, in one way, but that's, you know, again, Derry, Derry being a, a mentor and a sponsor. Uh, to me for that, and then subsequently Freddie, um, who's just, by the way, written an amazing book about the Supreme Court and how it came about, which is uh, plugging him. He just uh, uh, is giving a speech tomorrow, I think, about it, actually. Um, he also is a big supporter of mine. Um, and so I, what I found was that there were men who were prepared to support you because they were looking for people who were good to help them with with their practices, and that's how it worked. But for me, it was quite difficult to work out what sort of, what does a female advocate 
sound like, because I don't think I actually saw a woman plead a case in court the entirety of my pupillage. Um, though there were a couple of women in chambers, um, but I didn't see them. They were uh, actually do any cases. And so it's about, you know, Derry, was, Derry is a big man anyway, and he was a pretty much uh, quite an aggressive advocate. Um, you know, um, and I always remember at one point he did a case against, as a junior, against another junior called Tom Bingham, who those of you who know will know, also went to the highest levels of the, of the, of the legal hierarchy. Um, and I saw them both cross-examine the witness. And Derry was the rhinoceros, and Tom Bingham was the snake. <laughs> uh, and I thought, actually, you know, especially since I was still at that time, because I'd been from take, I'd been pushed up a year at school. I was still only twenty-one. I didn't think rhinoceros was going to to suit me, so I decided that I, Tom Bingham was Tom Bingham's approach was probably better for me. So you you always did quite a lot outside of chambers at the same time. So you were a school governor. You set up the Hackney branch of the Child Poverty Action Group. Uh, you got involved, I think, one night a week in helping out at a legal advice centre in a deprived area of London. What, what, what was that sort of like? I think it was it, partly, of course, it was partly my religious background and coming up as a, as a being brought up as a Catholic during the time in Vatican II. That probably means nothing to quite a few of the young people in the audience. Suddenly the Catholic Church was very much into the church in action and, you know, getting, in, getting involved. And, and also the, just the activism background in my own family and, and being very conscious of how lucky I was and how people like me were, were, were living in Tower Hamlets where the Cambridge House University Legal Advice Bureau was going on. They used to come to see, to see us with bits of plaster full of damp and things are just falling off their walls. I mean, you know, it, people lived, they still do, of course, live hard lives. And, it's always good to, to remember that. I was also very passionate about education. It made a big difference to me. Uh, and I was very committed to, as, as a school governor. I, mean, I was a school governor from the time I was did my pup pupillage and wanting to try and get the best possible education in our state's schools. Despite sort of saying that you didn't go into politics, um, you were still very involved in the Labour Party. And in 1983, both you and your husband were Labour Party candidates in the general election of that year. So how, how did that sort of work with each of you fighting for a seat in a different part of the country? I've always been fascinated by politics, and I enjoy politics uh, very much. Um, but for Tony, it was, beca it, it was very much a, a passion. Um, there was a period when he got to his, just before his 30th birthday, where I had managed to get myself a seat, a hopeless seat, it was Margate, down at North, uh, which, to be honest, I thought was South End and a bit nearer. <laughs> 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 and I turned up and I realised, my God, they've just won to all candidates, so, you know, I could, but as long as I could open my mouth, they were going to have me. Uh, it was much more difficult for Tony, but he ended up getting the last Labour seat in the country three weeks before the election was called, which was Sedgefield, which is, as we know, for the first time, no longer Labour. Um, and so there was a period when Tony was um, candidate's husband. <laughs> so I can safely say that I don't think Tony made very good First Lady material. <laughs> um, and uh, there the, the was an instant that I always remember, it. just before the election, we went to stay to visit my agent to talk about the forthcoming campaign. We had dinner at the, uh, lunch, and at the end of lunch, his, the wife turned around and said to Tony, Tony, he says, it's, I think Shireen and yeah, Bill need to talk politics, so do you mind if you come and help me with the washing up? <laughs> 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 I mean, honestly, I think he probably thought of divorcing me at that point. <laughs> Fortunately, he got a safe Labour seat, and so I did keep my deposit, which was unusual in Labour in 1983, not as unusual as it turned out in 19, uh, 2019, uh, and um, he became an MP. But, you know, I, I was asked about whether I'd like to apply, and I'm a great believer in 
if you're at, you know, you should try things. But it didn't, I was more passionate about the law. I still am more passionate about the law. Um, so I was perfectly happy after that for him, him to be the politician and me to have this great um, front row seat on political life without actually having to uh, do the, uh, the other things that are involved in being an MP, not least, you know, having a constituency over 400 miles away and balancing that with family life because I also discovered that when I was campaigning as a candidate, I was actually, actually pregnant, which I hadn't realized at the time. I was wondering why I had this craving for Bloody Marys. I don't, <laughs> I don't even like tomato juice, but every, day, every, every night after campaigning, I somehow or other, that's what I crave for. Now, obviously, these days, I would have probably you know, been convinced I'd permanently damaged the baby for good, but human seems to be doing all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> While your husband was an MP in the 1980s, you were the main breadwinner. So perhaps a little bit about your legal practice, because I know there were some really difficult family law cases you were sort of dealing with, um, also special needs children's cases. So perhaps a little bit about your legal practice as you were building it up, and but also how you coped with suddenly, you're the main breadwinner, your husband has a constituency 400 miles away, and you have children. Yeah, yeah it, well, it wasn't easy. At one point we had three under five. You know, it's not, not the easiest thing. Uh, I'm about to become the grandmother of three under five, but <laughs> so I know my daughter-in-law is also, a, she's a solicitor, so you know, I know how difficult that can be. Um, you're right, of course. What happened was when, when I started at the bar, in those days, chambers were much smaller. I mean, the chambers, you know, like more like between 10 and 20 people. Um, and everyone did everything. So, you know, I appeared in the Crown Court. I appeared doing, um, in the county court, doing small personal injury claims. I did family law. Um, and I also, because it, this, it was starting to, to open up, I also was able to do some uh, employment law. And I was able to keep that up partly because Derry would often bring me in as a junior. And in fact, the first case I ever did, which was in 1983, and it was in the, in the House of Lords, was with Freddie Reynolds as the second junior to him and Mark Savile in a case called Cheel and Apex, which was actually a trade union case uh, about um, whether you could be expelled uh, from, from a union. Um, and uh, I was representing the, the union in but mainly the bed and butter of my practice. Um, I did criminal law until about 83, but after that I did mainly civil law, so a lot of that was family, family law. And because of that I got to meet the local authority <coughs> lawyers. And so uh, in, the, start in the 1980s people, there was in 1981 the Special Education Needs Act was passed and people were starting, there was an appeal process for children with special education needs and local authorities started to need representation. They started asking me would I represent them, so uh, that's how I ended up, uh, you know, what is now a separate dis discipline of itself, but education law. So I, I managed to get into that through the connection. And then once I was doing education law, then they started again asking about public law issues, and I've always, again, been fascinated with law and politics, so I started doing much more judicial review, and, 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 and that practice then built up, and so then I dropped my family law and became purely, essentially, um, a, a, an advocate who worked in the high court, in, in the divisional court, and the administrative courts, and the courts above, above that, doing public law, doing employment law, going over, because in the 80s, during uh, when, in the glorious days when we were in the European Union, there, was, uh, there were rights that we had under European directives. And so I brought the first case um, for a lesbian couple who claimed uh, they wanted to uh, brought an equal pay case, case uh, against Southwest Trains. It's called Grant and Southwest Trains, where we were wanting to establish that they should have the same rights to uh, family members getting uh, um, subsidized rail, rail travel. If you were an unmarried couple of different sex, you could get it as long as you've been together for more than two years. She was 
with her partner for more than two years, and she said, I want this too, and this is an equal pay matter. We didn't win the case in the end, but you know, again, it was a way of uh, going up to the court. I, I did uh, cases about the, the, the mobility clauses being discriminatory in contracts, being discriminatory against women because it was harder for women to move. Uh, I did cases about pension um, uh, inequalities between uh, men, and, men and women, huge case about local authority pension funds. Uh, as you say, I did quite a few. I did the first case ever where we established first that uh, a girl with dyslexia, which had been undiagnosed by the local authority and therefore her special needs not recognized, was, had the right to sue the local authority for negligence over that. And then we took that case out and we, made, we, we, we won the first award for uh, negligence of, of a local authority. I subsequently went on and wrote the, with one of the juniors in Chambers uh, the, my first book uh, called The Negligence Liability of Public Authorities, which is uh, still going strong. It didn't exactly make my fortune, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but that was, so uh, I've always been interested in where law and politics meet and how you can use the law to push the boundaries. One thing people may not know about you is that you're incredibly good at technology. So <laughs> from the first PCs through to you're the right. iPad. Um, and you yeah, ended up... I sometimes show you what to do, don't I? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing people may not... Well, I, I suppose at that period, you actually became like the chairman of the IT and committee of the Bar Council. In fact, you were right to put me up with this because you say, how did, I, how did I manage with the children? Well, partly I had to. Partly because uh, even if at the beginning, basically it was virtually all my surplus money, I you know was able to hire a, a nanny uh, who lived in. So you know that meant if I was late or something, you know it was it was fine. Partly because Tony was a backbench MP in those days, and so he was did have some time when he could help out with the children. Um, and uh, but also because of technology, because by the uh, in 1988, when my daughter was born, I went off on my 10 days pregnancy leave. Um, yeah, not to be recommended. That's why I'm very passionate about women actually uh, understanding that they are entitled to take their leave. And actually, I, I don't like to call it pregnancy leave anymore. It's parental leave. That's what we need to have. But anyway, our, our chambers at that time had the clerks would write manually the accounts, and the secretaries. We would write manually our opinions, and they would then go to the typing pool, and they'd be typed out, and they'd come back, and we'd correct them, and it, it would go back. That was, that's in 1988. And we suddenly had this whole thing that we were going to go, in our account system was going to be computerized. And so along with the, the accounts package came two Olivetti PCs and something called WordPerfect 5. So all the men in chambers sort of, oh, what, what's this? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I can type. So why don't I take it with me and see what, what, what I can do? So I did take it with me and um, discovered that actually technology was incredibly useful for me as a self-employed barrister, enabling me to do basically my own typing and set up templates. And 18 months after that, I'd become the first chair of the bar IT committee, uh, where my mission was to tell other barristers how this could really make a big difference for you. Uh, we looked into things like video conferencing for trials. Uh, we looked into computerizing the courts. We were consulted. We were part with um, uh, Lord uh, Henry Brook committee on, on, on the computerization of the courts. Um, and also, I became part of a sort of pilot group about the first using modems, how you could send documents Online and I used to enabled me to go up to the constituency in Durham, 400 miles away, and you know still managed to send documents between the two. And then, of course, when we went into Downing Street, by which time we had an intranet, and you know the textbooks were online, and the, uh, the law reports were online. It enabled me to both do my first lady bits, like you know having tea with visiting Tanzanian First Lady, uh, and at the same time be working up in the flat 
on my papers, answering my clients' queries, and they would never necessarily know that I had been popping out for tea in, in between time. So that flexibility it gave me is, you know, really important. So I've always been passionate about how technology can help uh, people do things that they otherwise could not do, which is why after we left Downing Street and we set up, I, we set up the Sheree Blair Foundation for Women, it was to help women entrepreneurs, because as a barrister, you're self-employed, you're an entrepreneur, if you like, even though uh, some people would say, oh, barristers don't do trade. Yes, we do, really. Um, and um, I felt that it, technology enabled me to carry out my business as a fortunate woman. How much could it do to help women in low- and middle-income countries around the world who were finding themselves wanting to set up their businesses but not being in the position that someone in the UK in, in 2008, 2008 rather, might be, but more like either the position that I was in the 1970s when people were still saying women don't do that, or even more so, maybe like the position my mother was even before that. So how could we use technology to give them the skills and the confidence that they need? And it, it's very interesting. We recently ha had a survey of 760 of the women on our mentoring platform, and we asked them, um, about their, well, a number of things. Uh, over 80% of them were supporting someone else as well as themselves with, the, with their businesses, of which nearly 40% of them were supporting three or more people. Uh, and when you asked them whether they had, they had encountered any kind of, if not discrimination, certainly sexual stereotyping, uh, you know, again, 70% of them had absolutely and like a third of them had found ideas like women don't do business, you know, women aren't good with money, uh, a woman's place is in the home. Uh, all these assumptions about women, which, you know, echoed the assumptions about women that I'd found in the, in the 1970s and that Rose Halbrob had absolutely found in, in, in the 1940s. Um, so these issues are... Uh, you know, remain the same. How they manifest themselves depends on the uh, particular society in which you find yourself in. And just then thinking about that transition from, um, you know, your career and then as you came into public life, so just thinking about as your husband became more prominent in the shadow cabinet, then was leader of the opposition, then in 1997 when you entered Downing Street, you were the first Prime Minister's wife to have a substantial independent career of your own and wanting to continue that um, when you came into Downing Street. So I suppose a little bit about how to make it work because I can imagine some of the pressure on, you know, if you had controversial cases or if um, there were maybe clients who didn't want publicity or after 9-11 the constant police presence around your life. How, how, how easy or difficult was it to, to make it to work to continue what you were passionate about, your legal career, while also um, now having to deal with the public life that you were an in inherent part of? I think when I went into Downing Street, certainly many of the civil servants in there just assumed I'd obviously just give up. You know, <laughs> you know but I, I said, I've taken me to, I, by then I was a Queen's Counsel. I was very lucky to be actually a Queen's Counsel who was notified she'd be made succeeded in her application for silk, and the next day was able to actually to go and have dinner with the Queen in Windsor Castle and thank her personally. This <laughs> doesn't usually happen, uh, but that was because my husband was leader of the opposition and you have to go to Windsor Castle to, uh, to have dinner with the Queen. And it was, it was amazing because the, the royal librarian had set out a whole lot of stuff that they had in the royal library about female lawyers and women and, and about QC, so it was very nice of them. Um, but the, uh, you know, I'd done that, and I wasn't going to give that up just because my husband had changed his job. <laughs> um, and I, there was a whole row about that, because I was Sheree Booth QC, and they, they, not a row, but they said, well, you know, we can't really use that name. I, I remember we, we hosted a, a Commonwealth, not a Commonwealth, a e e European Council, and at that time the wives, they were, they were all coming for the European Council meeting, 
and I was going to host the spouses program. So I said, oh, we're not going to do the usual um, cooking and fashion. But I got someone in from the M NSPCC, and we talked about uh, eating, um, eating children. <laughs> That's perhaps a controversial way of saying it. <laughs> the disciplining of children and, 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 and the violence against kids and things like this. And the Foreign Office said to me, you're going to have to send these invitations out to Cherie Blair. She said, because if you don't, no one will know who you are. So I thought, oh, OK. So it went out to Cherie Blair. Anyway, when we turned up, uh, Mrs. Anya Botelli, uh, wife of uh, Prime Minister Aznar. Oh, she's Spanish. The Spanish ladies. Oh, no, they don't change their names. No. Uh, the Swedish Prime Minister's wife called Mrs. Bloggins, I can't remember now, but you know, not her husband's name. So basically, the Foreign Office were just spinning me a line. So, yeah. <laughs> so these, these are just trivial matters, though, really, in the end, uh, what, what, what's in a name. The important thing um, to me was to have my own identity and to have my feet on the ground by going out to court. Now, you're right, of course, some, <coughs> some cases I lost because I had been doing some cases for the government. And it was Lord Mackay, the Tory uh, Lord Chancellor, who made me silk. Um, but obviously, as soon as my husband became Prime Minister, I could not take on cases for the government anymore, because that would have been felt like it was favouritism. But I did do many cases against uh, the government, including a, a case where, when I was eight months pregnant, I appeared before Tom Bingham on behalf of the TUC, challenging the parental leave the implementation of the parental leave regulations that my husband's government had done in the TUC didn't feel they, and I agreed, they didn't go far enough. So that caused a lot of sort of Blair v. Blair um, headlines. And of course, sometimes people would want me to do their cases because they thought, some of them blessed them that I had influence, you know, and could somehow make, make a difference. But the great thing about our system, and Hillary Clinton said this to me, she said, as First Lady, I could never have carried on being a, a lawyer because of the political appointment of judges. But in our system, of course, uh, there isn't that. Uh, in fact, the opposite, judges are meant to stand out from their political affiliations. Um, and I don't think, particularly since I've been in those courts already for 25 years, any of the judges were only listening to me because I was the wife of the Prime Minister. They were listening to me because they knew I knew what I was talking about, or at least they should know what I was talking about. That's what I'm paid to know. And actually, I thought there was a wonderful um, letter that was written to you by a barrister you didn't know during this time, um, Robert Flack. And so I thought I might just um, yeah. just mention it because I thought it, it showed how you were dealing with being a lawyer at the same time as being in Downing Street. And Robert Street. Was, n was not a Labour supporter by any means, no. And, and, <laughs> so he, and he wrote, and I, I just thought it was interesting to share, was he wrote, the bar is a profession with a great deal of gossiping during the many hours of waiting to which we are all at times condemned. Although your name for obvious reason crops up in many conversations, I've never heard anyone speak ill of you in any way whatsoever. I've heard judges in whose court you sat as a recorder comment on the courteous and modest way in which you treated oh, them. Oh, yeah, you're making me feel embarrassed a, now. A young female... <laughs> Just one more anecdote he gives. A young female member of my chambers told me of her first appearance in the law courts when she was understandably terrified and an older lady spoke to her in the robing room and tried to allay her fears. She was so grateful, although she did not know who you were until she saw your name on your wig box. You're respected for your ability, your manner, and your integrity, as well as your devotion to your clients. So I thought that was a wonderful tribute to be able to continue in your chosen career yeah. while having to deal with the all of public life he, he at the wrote same that time. because of one of the Daily Mail campaigns against me, so that, that was very kind. <laughs> uh, and um, funny, funny enough, just I always write to all the, well, any QCs I know, because that's the tradition, but also every woman QC, uh, because now we're up to about 400 odd. I was number 76. So Rose was number one in 49. In 95, was it 95? Or was it 94? Oh, I forget. And I think. So long ago, I became number 76. Um, and now we're in 400. And one of the women uh, was the first Crown Prosecution Service lawyer to take silk. And so I, I wrote to her, and, and she wrote back a letter, and she said that 
she remembered one of her first cases as a lawyer was in front of me as a recorder, and it would, it, the client had absconded. Anyway, that I'd been very nice to her, and she still remembered it. So that's it's amazing. You know, the law is a, a very collegiate profession. It's still certainly the bar is still a very small profession, and we tend to be quite protective of our own, which was was jolly good when the Daily Mail's on your case. You know, <laughs> at least for some people. Who, uh, who don't just see you as, as, as a political pawn that they can move around the uh, board. Well, while you were in Downing Street, you were involved in setting up matrix chambers with the idea this would be a totally different sort of barrister's chambers. So what, what was the idea behind it? Well, I think, again, as I said, I didn't... At the time, I wouldn't have thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but the, the fact was I've always been interested in the business of the law as well, and how, how do we deliver the service to our clients. So I'd, uh, we'd, I'd been involved in a num number of chambers by then, and partly because the Human Rights Act were coming in, I, I was getting um, impatient with the old-fashioned way of doing things with the barrister's clerk. Uh, and I also was concerned that, uh, whereas I'd done so many, many different kinds of law and was very conscious of where you can use principles from one into another, that it was getting much more in silos. And so we wanted to break that down, in, particularly in relation to, to human rights in Matrix and do law a bit differently. And we, we, had, we had great principles, uh, including, I always remember, I was all in favor of it until when we came, we, when we set up Matrix, we went to our, into our new room and we decided we would not allocate rooms on seniority, we do it by ballot. Um, so you just drew it out the hat, which seemed to all fine and dandy until you know, I ended up drawing up some, some very, uh, uh, very minor room. And, uh, <laughs> this was not so great. So then I, uh, uh, I kind of agreed to pay double or whatever. <laughs> got, got a better room. <laughs> Comes a point in your stage of life when true equality becomes harder to practice what you preach. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, the box room by the toilet was not my <laughs> ideal. Um, but, you know, so we wanted to do things differently. And, and it was that impetus, if you like, to do things differently that led to Matrix, which is now, you know, we started off again as quite a small group. You know, now it's a very large chamber, very successful, and led me in 2012 to actually decide again because of changes in the law, this time in relation to the ability to allow barristers to go into practice with uh, solicitors, that I wanted to do something different. And that's when I set up Omnia Strategy, where we now engage in international law disputes, uh, mainly involving governments or government entities in one way or another, and uh, where we do what we call Law Plus. It's about, yes, the law, but it's also about the knowledge of how politics works, how policy works, that um, is very important when you're doing these international law disputes. So now I do purely international law, and we do uh, these big international trade disputes. Yes, Boris, I actually have taught people about how you negotiate a trade agreement. I wouldn't recommend the way you're going about it, but <laughs> there you go. And the other part of our practice is what we call our business and human rights practice, which builds on, again, I long-standing commitment to, to human rights, but this time about how we ensure that business and business people uphold the high standards, whether it's bribery and corruption, whether it's impact on the environment, or whether it's about uh, the way as corporate citizens they behave towards their employees, their supply chain, and the local communities in which they engage, These what we call in the jargon ESG. And I was, I was saying to you, wasn't I, uh, Andrew, that I feel in, in your, inter your practices that you're doing at the moment, both in international law, but also in what you're doing about human rights and business, that these, that, that these are some things that your students actually uh, could study and, and would be interested in as a, as a way of um, not only uh, doing business, but doing business in the right way. During the new Labour government, the Human Rights Act was adopted and there were some other really enormous uh, changes in constitutional law, my area of law. So you had um, devolution, you had the introduction of the Supreme Court. As someone 
intricately involved in the law, you would have had opinions and thoughts uh, about all of these. Um, in your role sort of in Downing Street, did you feel you were able to advocate for your thoughts on matters you knew a lot about, or did you have to stand back when issues such as introducing a Supreme Court or bringing in the Human Rights Act were, were being discussed? I think this is a very, uh, possibly even topical sub subject at the moment, tricky subject when you're married to the Prime Minister. Because remember, uh, the, Prime Minister, <laughs> the Prime Minister is elected. The government ministers are elected. You're his wife, that's not the same thing. Uh, and you, you may have influence, but you should not have power in any way, shape, or form. Because if you want to have power, you should do it the right way, which is to stand yourself for election. Um, so I, um, and indeed, there's no way that uh, uh, it would just would have happened that I could interfere in, in uh, policy. However, if there were some things, and my husband asked me for my opinion, I would certainly tell him his, my opinion, for which he could take or leave it as he liked. And certainly, the only person I could express my opinion to was him. It was not my place to express my opinion to the ministers or the civil servants or even special, special advisors. And I think that is the right way to do that. Um, and insofar as things like the Human Rights Act, obviously I'd been involved in the campaigns in relation to that anyway. So, I mean, and I, if, I'm, if I did make a speech about it because I was married to the Prime Minister, then probably, you know, that might make more interest. People might pay more attention to it. The only, the only time when, I, I don't think I crossed the line because it was government policy that this issue arose was... Um, when we went actually to, when George Bush was, uh, was president and we went to the Crawford Ranch um, and the, there were, it was in the run up to the Iraq war and there were a lot of discussions. But at the same time, um, just one of the last things that Bill Clinton did before he stood down was to sign the Statute of Rome, which is the statute that sets up the International Criminal Court. And, um, it was suggest it was the rumor was that George Bush was going to unsign it, and so towards the end of the meeting we left, I couldn't help myself. I did say to him, George, do not unsign the 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 the, the ICC. Um, you know, it's not necessary. You know, everyone knows Congress is never going to ratify it anyway. You know, please don't do it. And he was not very happy with me, but I knew it was actually our foreign office policy, so I thought, well, it's foreign office policy. So. Uh, but George, really, I should have done Did George that, Bush listen? He always listened very courteously. I remember another time when he came, um, he came to check us this time, and uh, we had a very spirited debate about the, <laughs> the death penalty, uh, including my children. They had a very spirited views about it as well. <laughs> which, uh, you know, he... He took in, in, in good part, uh, partly because, of course, he knew this wasn't a policy decision. He wasn't talking with officials. This was sitting uh, amongst us as, as a family talking about things that me and my kids cared about. You may assume from that that I was not in favor of the death penalty, <laughs> but you probably would have imagined that already. <laughs> Thinking of your charity work, because in Downing Street you started instituting sort of weekly evenings for charities. Um, you were president of Bernardo's. You were involved with um, refuge of scope um, for disabled special needs children. Uh, you became patron of breast cancer care, having known, um, having an aunt and other ones you loved who had been lost to cancer. Um, you, you did an awful lot. Um, how easy was that in terms of uh, because I know in Downing Street, the wife of the, the role of the spouse is fairly ill-defined, and who pays for what, and um, you know all, all of those sorts of matters. How, how easy was it to really make charity work a, a centre of what you were doing that was, there? Actually, in the end, that that was regarded as acceptable, and I think uh, you know, um, I got a, a lot of help from the people who organized things in Downing Street because, you know, it's useful to use these rooms and they hadn't been used as much. And it's a way of, of, 
contributing to good causes. And it wasn't me who chose the charities. Like Charities would write in. Um, obviously, some charities I was associated with, and they all did have a Downing Street reception. But others and the civil servants would select which ones we would support, and then I would go along and I would host that. It's something, it's about using Downing Street for the benefit of the people that it belongs to, which is actually not the Prime Minister, but it's the people of, of the country. And I used to, I enjoyed it very much to see the amazing work that goes on up and down our country of people who are passionate about the arts or passionate about children or health, passionate about overseas, you know, helping in international development. And, you know, we don't often acknowledge them or hear from, from them. Uh, because it's in Downing Street, you're not allowed to fundraise in Downing Street, but you are allowed to uh, advocate for the for the cause, if you, if you like, and that's that's what we did, and I, I enjoyed it very much, and I felt it was very much something that I could do um, as the wife of, of the Prime Minister. And it's been a major part of your life since leaving Downing Street. So in 2008, you set up the Cherie Blair Foundation, and just... Uh, last month at Davos, you announced the 100,000 woman campaign. Do you want to say a few words about what sure, that is Sure, absolutely. About? We, I've been, um, you'll notice it's called Cherie Blair, because by this time, when I was coming to set up the charity, you know, I thought, if I call it the Cherie Booth, maybe they wouldn't know who I was, or at least maybe not 10 years on. Um, and so, you know, the important thing is the cause. So it's about using technology to help women with training in business skills, in net, setting up business networks and mentoring, um, to give them the tools to enable them to grow and expand their businesses, not just for themselves' sake and their family's sake, but actually as job creators in so many low- and middle-income countries. And in the last first 10 years of our work, in fact, the last now, 11 years, we've reached over 160,000 women now in over 100 countries. And so in Davos, in January, we launched our 100,000 women campaign. We're going to, we want to raise £10 million over three years to reach another 100,000 women with this blended uh, use of technology to provide skills to women. In, in a way, I sometimes say we, we have a a course which uh, delivers training skills on the mobile phone. I always call it a nano MBA. It's, it's five to seven minutes uh, business tips and training skills uh, that a, a woman who has a small business could be doing in between clients or whilst waiting to pick her children up from school, but can develop skills and, uh, and uh, expertise. And, and there's a provision where you can contact other women who are on the app and so therefore build up networks. And then we have our larger programs for women who are perhaps, most of the women on these programs tend to be, it's like a three months training course, uh, and they tend to be university educated who are setting up businesses. So uh, bigger businesses that are going to employ already are employing people, you know, sometimes 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 100, 200. But again, helping them get uh, to a stage that they can take their business to the next stage, including getting uh, investment in one way or another in, in those businesses with the idea of, again, providing jobs for, for other people and becoming role models and, and leaders in their communities. Because in this world, money talks. But if you can make, as I learned from my mother, if you can support yourself and get and control your own money, then people will listen to you and... And as you are successful, uh, it enables you to talk about the things that you care about, both in business and, and beyond. So that's, uh, that's where we are. We've got 25 people in the foundation. Uh, it's run by our CEO. Uh, it's not run by me. I'm just the founder. Uh, and I do a lot of advocacy for it. Um, and uh, we have a board of trustees, and I'm not on the board of trustees either. So they do the they do the governance um, and that works very well and then on the other hand we have Omnia where we have 15 people where that is my day-to-day -day job where I am the chair of that and I actually am involved in the cases but that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's my how I earn my living <laughs> whereas the foundation is how I try and give back 
go, actually, that's a bit unfair on Omni because we do try and give back too. <laughs> because that would be one of our core values. <laughs> One of the other areas you give back in, um, you're the patron of the Liberty Choir, and you oh, gave yes. the the first Longford lecture on penal reform. Um, what what do your mind and and prisons have been a great feature yeah. in the recent election campaign? What what do you think needs to be done with respect to prisons? Absolutely funny enough, I was I think I was the uh, I'm not sure I can't categorically say only, but I think it was the first, certainly the first spouse of a prime minister to ever visit a prison. So obviously. Uh, officially, if you like, rather than as a, as a, as a barrister, <laughs> or, or indeed, yes, I, should, I suppose I should say as, a, as an inmate. Uh, and uh, and in fact, Tony was the first prime minister to visit a prison, um, which is extraordinary when you think about it. Really, um, you know, I'm not it, criminal law has not been the area that I have chosen to practice in, but obviously, I sat as a recorder in criminal law for a long, long time, and so I sent people. To uh, in addition to that, human rights is one of the things I'm concerned about. And uh, you know, anyone who's ever been to prison will know just how fascinating they are. Liberty Choir is just one of those uh, things that I've been pulled into because of my interest in prison. And I don't know if any of you saw um, Gareth Williams recently went into prison. He went to get some hints from the extraordinary woman who, who runs Liberty Choir, you know, uh, the way we treat our prisoners, uh, the number of people we imprison, it's, it's, it's just not good enough. It's, it's not good enough. It doesn't actually protect the public. When you look at young offenders and how 70% of them will re-offend within a year, um, how is, given the expense of keeping them in prison, how is that value for money? If our hospitals were not healing 70% of their patients, they would be a public outcry about it. But our prisons are not helping the rehabilitation of 70% of their occupants. And yet everyone seems to think that prison works. Uh, it's, 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 it's clearly we need to think more boldly about it. And uh, the problem we've had over the last few years, as everybody, whether it's the Bar Council or the Law Society or anyone else who knows, the judges is the cuts that have been made in our, our system, whether it's in the probation service, the prisons themselves, the cutting down in courts. Uh, the whole system is, is under tremendous strain at the moment. And your know, fundamental duty of government is to uh, provide a functioning uh, both criminal and civil court system. And we are failing at the moment. And this is a tragedy for those of us who believe you know, the British common law and the British system, which is spread across the world, uh, you know, is the gold standard. But actually, in what's happening is our courts are crumbling, our prisons are crumbling, uh, our probation service is not fit for purpose. And uh, it's not serving the public. So we desperately need uh, some radical reforms there, for sure. But also we have to treat prisoners humanely and remember that they're still human beings. And so that's partly about the Liberty Choir is for some of these men, it's the first time anyone's really given, given them a, a chance to come and become part of a community or um, uh, uh, restorative justice is a very important part of that. I mean, I could... I could go on forever about it, but uh, it's probably not enough time to do that. Yeah, and perhaps just two or three last sort of facets of your life. And perhaps, perhaps actually the singing is an interesting one, because oh, I, yeah. did, I did see you singing with prisoners in the Liberty yeah. Choir a few months ago, but, um, and singing and music have been integral karaoke to your life. <laughs> is, it, is it true that you, you, you were asked to sing by Silvio Berlusconi? Yes, that is true. Of course it's true. Yeah. I mean, I often say that uh, I, my sing, I, I've always loved singing. Um, I think often of some of the, you'll find lots of barristers, lots of advocates do, because I think it's about the voice. Um, um, so I was in a choir from my primary school. I went to the East Deadford, and I was in a choir at, at school. But um, 
And when, when Tony first became an MP, he used to go, go round, or when he, even when he was look, with looking to be an MP, he'd go to union conferences and things, and he was the public school barrister, and then he said, but here's my wife, the girl from Liverpool, who will now sing to you six, <laughs> <laughs> six, sea, six sea shanties from Liverpool, you know? <laughs> he usually went down a treat, or, 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 or the time that uh, we went to, um, we went, when we were in Hong Kong in China, or in, the Chinese students, we were in uh, uh, Beijing, and, and one of them asked, asked what, Tony was doing this whole speech thing. I'd been to talk to the, the lawyers, and I'd come back, and they were there. And one of them asked him, did he like the Beatles? He just, and they said, you know, would you, what's your favorite Beatles song? Will you sing it for us? <laughs> so he said, uh, I won't sing it, but Cherie likes singing. And so, <laughs> thrust the, the, the microphone to me, and I sang... Uh, for some mad reason, uh, I think it was when I'm 64. Because <laughs> uh, the first thing that came into my head. And, uh, and then later on, it became, apparently it was in the I dance halls of Ibiza that year, the, 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 they mixed it with something else and they were, they were all, <laughs> it, it was crazy. But yes, Sylvia Berlusconi, Tony and I, much to my displeasure, in the middle of our summer holidays in Italy, he and his wisdom decided we had to go down and visit Silvio Berlusconi in Sardinia to try and persuade him to give the two Italian votes to the London bid. Uh, so, so off we went down there. It was supposed to be a very low-key event. And we went down to the place where I think he did have his bunga bunga parties, but we did not have <laughs> such a thing. In fact, he actually invited his wife and his children there, so it was a completely uh, different uh, thing. But Silvio, you know... He, he also likes singing. He writes these kind of like Sicilian type of Italian ballads. And when we were there, we would walk around. Behind us would be his guy playing the guitar who would walk and be strumming along and then sing. <laughs> and so he organized this, um, this kind of hospitality. It was supposed to be a low-key event. So we say there was a firework display which across the bay said, Welcome, Tony Blair. <laughs> Probably. Um, he'd also just had his hair transplant done, so he came out with a bandana. So that picture went all over the world, Tony and me with Berlusconi with his, looking like a pirate. <laughs> uh, but, and he'd hired some singers from sort of proper, proper singers to come and entertain us. But in the middle, he said, no, stop, stop. Went over and decided that he was going to sing. So he took the thing off, off the professional singer and started singing. And then he insisted, uh, again, you know, that we should sing. So Cherie's pushed out, and I ended up singing Summertime, you know, Summertime and the Living is Easy with Sylvia Berlusconi. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the highlights of, of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Two last questions. Um, your faith is really important to you, and I was interested to see coming right up to today that you're listed as the executive producer on a film set in Jerusalem called The Rock Pile. What, what, what's that about? Well, that, 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 that's actually, funny, funny enough, I was just having a phone call about it yesterday. Um, I was approached about, about, about this film, and it, it's, it is partly because I go back to what I said about growing up in the 60s in the Second Vatican Council. So that was the first time as school, we, we, we actually started to learn about different faiths. So I've always been interested in about people of faith coming, coming together. And indeed, Tony is equally interested in that. It's one of the missions of his um, institute these, these days about faith and extremism. Um, and of course, he was, after Downing Street, he was the Middle East envoy. And as a result of that, I also, with my foundation, did quite a lot of work with women entrepreneurs in Israel and Palestine. So I know quite a lot about how, on the ground, between the different communities, people can come together and there is a lot of goodwill and a desire for peace. And so when I was approached about this film, which is about how three boys in Jerusalem, um, one a Christian, one a Muslim, and one a Jewish boy, come together, they're throwing stones at each other and then one day they start kicking a ball around and through sport, through football, uh, they develop a, a friendship which then attracts the interest of a journalist um, who 
uh, and then there's a sub story but 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 the, the film is about that idea how people can come together through common interests even when they start off in what seem to be irreconcilable uh, positions. It's also um, the three boys will come from uh, Jerusalem or from around there. They will be local boys. There's a part in it of a Palestinian woman journalist. We want to recruit a Palestinian woman to be and uh, be that part. And then Hugh Bonneville is um, going to play another major part in it. And it just seemed to me an amazing project. And they asked me, could I help? So as I said to you, I'm always one of these people who says, oh, that's an interesting experience. So I'm just a girl who can't say no. So I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I said yes to you. <laughs> to come tonight, exactly. <laughs> it shows it pays to ask. Um, the, I'm aware, you know, a lot of people might want to ask questions, and so, um, you know, they're, they're, if we start sort of taking questions from the audience, we may be here all night, but Cherie's kindly agreed to stay for some drinks afterwards, so, um, so outside there are going to be drinks, so if people would like to come in, up and ask questions, um, that would be an opportunity, um, but I suppose, therefore, the last question for now is really one about, we have a whole diversity, I think, of people here, of students. You've been chancellor of two universities, a governor of two universities. Education's been important in your life. I suppose, to me, the City Law School, you know, one thing that's always struck me is, is, is the sheer spread of where people come from. We have some of our students um, have come from Oxford and some of the best universities in Britain. Um, some have come from all sorts of um, universities in other parts of the world. Uh, we also have some people who are just starting out, who not everyone's had the same education opportunities. Some are commuting from North and West London. Um, some have come from different parts of Europe and internationally. So, I'm sure some of them must be the first people in their family to go to university too. So if you were to sort of, here they are sort of, I suppose, pondering in some ways in the next year or two, you know, what are they going to do with their lives? What are they going to make of this moment? I mean, looking back on your life in the law, um, your life in, in the public eye, what, what sort of advice would you give have been the most important things uh, well, one, for you? <laughs> one of the most important things is to have confidence in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, how can you going to convince anyone else to believe in you? And I'm afraid, as I said, I'm a girl who just can't say no, so I always believe if an opportunity comes your way, seize it. Take it. Who knows where it might lead you? I don't guarantee it will lead you to marrying the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it will lead you to become the Prime Minister, which would actually be much better. So. <laughs> I think we've, um, we would all agree that we've been privileged to hear from a quite exceptional woman, from someone who puts her heart into all she does, and who as a result has made an incredible difference, um, has achieved a lot in the law, but also for children, for women, for men, and for society in general. Would you join me in thanking Cherie Blair? Thank you.